My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. Join us for the Marketplace of Ideas live in Los Angeles on Saturday, March 29th at Dutton's Brentwood Bookstore. Come bid Dutton's farewell as we record a conversation with Mark Sarvis, founding blogger of The Elegant Variation and author of the upcoming novel Harry Revised. It starts at noon on Saturday, March 29th at Dutton's Brentwood Bookstore. It's at 11975 San Vicente Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. Listen to any Marketplace of Ideas interview anytime on our online archive on the website colinmarshallradio.com or download them from iTunes. Open up iTunes and search for the Marketplace of Ideas. And there you can also subscribe and get it every single week automatically. Early days. 
case of missiles. You could save a fraction of a gram, you know, you could make your missile work. And so I think it's close to the evolving silicon industry, the transistor companies that then started making chips in this valley before it was even known as Silicon Valley. And I got the introduction to it through him. I got training in various electronics projects. He always supported me on, I preferred to choose electronic projects for the school science fair. And my brother and sister weren't, you know, pushed in the direction of engineering. I wasn't pushed in the direction of engineering. I just loved it so much. And my father was able to, uh, you know, guide me and explain things on a blackboard, show me how atoms worked and what electrons were and how electrons flowed through wires, that sort of thing. The ones I remember the most were some very big projects that I did for science fairs. I started out with small science fair projects, little things about the equivalent of a flashlight, you know, but all the parts kind of laid out and hooked up, do it yourself. And then I moved up to, um, I think my, my first big project was a big display of an atom showing 92 electron positions, all with lights, and then there were 92 switches, and you could turn the switch for carbon, and the lights, and the six of lights would turn on, showing you which electron bands were used for carbon. And it was a huge project because it involved hundreds of parts, relays, switches, wires, the learning I had to do. Um, it was not a small, typical, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade type project. By sixth grade, I built um, a tic-tac-toe computer which had hundreds of transistors, and every transistor was what's called a logic gate implementing one rule of tic-tac-toe. The rule might be if there's an X in this corner and an X in that corner, and the space in between is free, take it. Um, I guess we had time because it, these were large, large, large projects, and I would just work for, you know, days and even weeks, and knowing that, you know, every little addition helped a lot. You know, I mean, I remember by eighth grade, I just, when I started getting very, you know, one thing you do when you're kind of, you kind of care about something, you start becoming more of an artist. It doesn't look junky anymore. My tic-tac-toe computer, I nailed nails into a piece of plywood and just soldered anything anywhere. By eighth grade, I built an outer subtractor, but I bought these well-gridded, laid-out boards and stuck pins in in a very well-ordered fashion that I had designed myself on a piece of paper, put in the resistors and the transistors. You know, I had to solve some electrical problems and change the circuit. So and that's a long project. I mean, you work on it, you know, for days and days, for weeks, for months from the planning, the laying out on paper, pencil and paper, you know how you're going to build it, then you build it, you test it, you get it working. And I had no idea that I was on the exact right path to understand and design computers someday. I just thought I was doing a real fun thing that I loved doing that nobody else did. To those that become an art, they tend to speak like almost if there were a hundred different ways you could write a certain little program, there's kind of one or two ways that are so outstanding that anybody who is really an expert could look at these things, yes, you know, for reasons of straightness and clarity and just a very few steps getting the job done, this is the more better correct approach. And there'll be some variation in opinion, but generally you can judge certain things have an artistic quality. It means getting a lot out for very little in, having hit on something very clever that you might not even be taught in a book, a very different approach than normal. And it's almost like trying to be better than the average normal people, trying to be the best in the world. And that gets into a few engineers, not all. Well, especially when I was young, I started designing computers on paper. I could never afford the parts for it. But you know what? I played a game, and my game was, how can I design the same computer? Maybe it's a computer made by Hewlett Packard. Maybe it's a computer made by Varian Corporation. How can I redesign it in another weekend but use fewer parts than I did last weekend? So I got in this little game, and it was just, it was just odd. It was just trying to beat myself, compete with myself. You have no limits. You get very good, and you force your head to think and think and think further than I thought before. It's like finishing a project and saying, I don't want to stop here. I want to go back and say, can I have done this project any better? Could I have saved some parts?
parts? Could I have done something that worked a little better or cost less money? And then hunt and hunt and hunt, maybe for weeks in the back of your mind, and come up with a new, better solution. <laughs> No, I ran into some that were the just do it yourselfers and they scrapped and they got this part and figured out how to do this. They just had a curiosity of how can I combine parts to do stuff that doesn't have any money value when they're young and building these little kits. But it's very, it's like interesting. It puts them in a different category than other people. And I was one of those. Just, I don't know, we feel like this is our thing in life that we're good at. We're usually not, you know, in the social you know, group, the high-level social group at school, we've spent our time doing other things. I, I just sort of knew it. I don't know if it was a good feeling. In other words, if you want to do something else in life, you know, if you knew your purpose in life, that's a good feeling. Also, there's another thing. Like, I didn't have to go to college and say, well, when I get out of college, what am I going to do? I didn't have to go through any of that worries. I knew from high school on, I was so good at electronics, I could go down and get jobs doing electronics anywhere. So it's very good to have that kind of a, a skill. It's like a vocational skill. And a lot of the worries in life, what am I going to do? What am I going to be? They just never existed for me. <laughs> the dream. I've got, I've got to go back and remember what exactly how the book is written. Um, Well, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I had a, uh, I used to design computers when I could never afford a single part. So I was on pencils and papers in high school in my bedroom. And I told my dad, someday, I'm going to have a computer. And I said, it's going to be a, a duck of a computer. I can write a program, a 4K Data General Nova. And he said, well, it costs as much as a house. And I was stunned. I had no money. I was young in school. And I said, well, I'm going to live in an apartment. Somehow, I was going to put my money into a computer instead of a house. I wanted my own someday. I was skilled. I knew how to use these devices. And even if it wouldn't, I didn't have a job or I could make any money at it, I just wanted my own computer because I got that much enjoyment out of writing programs. Now, even when we had clubs of hundreds of people that were somehow sensing that, that a usable computer was getting close to being affordable, they didn't have the formula down right yet, even then we didn't imagine that computer could have enough memory to hold a song. And if it ever got that much memory, oh my God, what would you ever do with it? We couldn't even imagine those sort of things. We could imagine computers in the, the kind of the state they were already in. You could write programs that spoke text on your screen, you wrote words on your screen, and then you type words back, and they could do things like help you balance a checkbook or store a list of recipes or things like, you know, help you write a letter. We really did envision word processing. We figured people would now get rid of typewriters, sit down on a keyboard, type things in, make corrections, and say print it. That was one thing that we were on target with. It was actually quite a shock to the world, the graphics that was built into the Apple II. The Homebrew Computer Club came about less from being a bunch of technical people around wanting a place for their technical activities and probably more from those who were, you know, advanced kind of social thinkers, thinking about a world and how it's going to change and how people are going to live in the future. And technology was a key part of that. So they very much, these sort of academics coming out of the Stanford area and the Berkeley area very much respected technology as being the key to how people were going to communicate better, educate better, and get work done, you know, better than the big mainframes in the companies. And we, we just took it on as like, this is our little revolution where we're saying that we little small guys with our small computer are going to be more powerful than, you know, the big guys with their multi-million dollar computers. You know, the big companies were saying, nah, it was going to be a tiny little business. They weren't interested. Companies like Digital Equipment Corporation. And that just, Spurred us on, made us even more passionate, made us care 
feel this, oh my gosh, they're missing out. You know, we're on to something new and so all the financial investors missed out on how important this was going to be. And it was difficult to see that there would be such a thing as a spreadsheet and that it would be so incredibly valuable that people who could never afford a computer before, small businessmen, were going to all of a sudden have to buy them because in half a day they could do more than 10 years worth of work. Well, you know, you, if, if you're ever going to put if what's more important, the human or the technology, we all want to say the human is more important. But a lot of times engineers just, oh, I can get this done, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that. And then they, they stop once they achieve something and not say, how could I do it in a way that works better for a human, a way that's more understandable, a way that's more like how humans do things in their real life. I mean, just a simple, simple example is the shape of an apple mouse being like a stone that feels nice in a creek or the um, calling the screen of a television set a desktop because everybody is familiar with the concept of what a desktop is. You know, finding these little human metaphors that help us do things our way instead of us having to adapt to do it the technology way. It was really a big thrill in my life. It was like a eureka moment. I knew that I had the formula for a complete computer that was enough that I could write programs in that did useful things. Did my work at Hewlett Packard, for example. I didn't have a little toy that is the basis of a computer. That is a little processor with not enough memory to ever write a program, but just to tell people, oh, I can toggle switches and push buttons and I get ones and zeros in the memory. To me, that wasn't a computer. There was a certain level it had to be. I had been moving towards it, project after project after project, for five years in a row. I had built a little simple computer um, five years before all this happened even. And now everybody else was building these little simple computer kits that were really just processor kits. They weren't real computers. And I'd already been there. Well, you always move forward in life. And I said, because of the projects I had stumbled into, just for wanting to have important things of my own, Wanting to have a pong game when I saw one in a bowling alley. Wanting to have a terminal that somehow I could type to a computer far away on this thing called the ARPANET, which was going to become today's Internet. It's the early investigation to it. I just wanted those devices, so I had already built them. I was a step up. All I had to do was, at first, was put a little tiny chip called a microprocessor and some memory on a on a board with other parts that I already had to talk to computers in Boston. Now I could talk to my own computer, and when the letters came up on the screen, I knew that I had a device that I would, I would eventually, I would write my own programming language, I would be able to program for the rest of my life, I would never run out of things to do. There was no idea to start a company or anything. As a matter of fact, I started passing out the schematics at the Homebrew Computer Club, and I said, hey, you can build your own computer, you know? You guys who want to take these new devices and show the world how great we can be and how important we can be in the world, now you can build your own. Here is the formula that you can afford. And I started passing it out for free. I guess the starter company came much later. Oh, I, 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 I truly hate it. I mean, I'm really the sort of person who just wanted the most quiet, simple life to be writing neat programs and developing neat hardware and talk to technical people my whole life. And um, no, never, ever. I was shy. don't want to be, um, I, I would just rather be out of the view, public view. But then again, I also have, unfortunately, life philosophies that I had when I was 20 years old. To be accessible, not to hide, you know, to have things like listed phone numbers. And it bogs me down a lot. I, I spend an awful lot of time just dealing with fans who are never to talk with me, nothing important, you know, but just the fact that they can talk to me, they want to, and it takes a lot of my time. The book is some days. I have, I have light days, too, light days and heavy days, but sometimes it's like the entire day. People start asking questions. You know, email, it really killed me. Until email, I was okay. And then email came along, and boy, everybody can get a hold of everybody in the world, and I'm easy to get a hold of them. Reading emails, it doesn't take too long. But answering, when I have to sit down and type answers and think about them, 
Yeah, that just bugs me. So I always have a huge list of ones that are critical. I've got to answer them, and the list grows to, you know, 20 or 30 or 40, sometimes 80 of those backed up. And, you know, that's a, that is a bother in my life. Not that bad. I, there were times that I would get, like, um, 400 important emails a day, and I would say now it's down to more like 150. Handleable, but it depends how many of them need thinking and responses. Now, that's besides my spam. I have I have an online spam filter where you have to be approved to get your mail through to me, and it traps all my spam. It traps probably 2,000 a day. And I, and I actually go back and check them all, just in case there's one that's from a real person or one from a company where I ordered a product. But I, I, I have this real tricky thing where I don't use my normal email address when I order stuff online. I, I have a separate email address I use for that, and if it ever starts getting too much spam, I'll move to a different email address. No, no. When we first started, the Internet was just open. It was free. People that wanted to share ideas could share ideas. And it wasn't even very commercial at first. The first couple of years of the Internet, you know, when that came on, it was just, um, it was really unfortunate. Because everyone hates spam, yet there's no way that we'll ever stop it, and the laws will never be against it. Well, um, I came into teaching school um, early in my life. I decided that education was very important based on things my father had taught me, that teachers were the most important people in our lives, and Without them, we wouldn't have a future, and I decided I wanted to be a teacher someday, second to being an engineer. Well, after Apple was big and successful, normally, you know, your life goes into being some big fat cat, investing all this money and running big, huge, expensive programs in the company. For the rest of your life, you just have a lot of resources to become an investment type person. My money wasn't investment, wasn't finance. I never started a company for money. I said, who would I have been if Apple hadn't happened? What would I have done in my life? And I went back to college. I got my college degree. And eventually, I wanted to teach fifth grade. And eventually, I just started teaching computers to the local fifth grade schools. I got very involved in the school technology programs and districts as schools were becoming wired. And then the Internet came, and I provided the Internet in my district. But sitting down one-to-one -one with kids, I, you know, I had a choice. I could write some books. I could write some CDs and go out and sell them, you know, to hundreds of thousands of kids. Or I could sit down and teach 30 kids in a classroom where I'm there hands to hands with them, almost like a parent. And that's what I always wanted to do in my life. So that's what I did. For eight years, pretty much kept the press away. But I just wanted to, to be one of those people that had, you know, been a big part of these, you know, real directly, hand to hand, young people's lives. Well, I didn't want to teach them to become a technical nerds like myself because the world isn't set up where it needs everybody to have technical skills. I mean, there's no one thing, even the things we learn in life, like mathematics, there's no need that everyone has to be able to calculate where two canoes are going to meet on a river. It's just, you know, very little do you use that sort of math in life, even if you are an engineer. So I decided, here's what I'll do. It was based upon a... Um, kind of an Apple teacher of the year that I had met and become friends with. What she did was she used her Apple II computer in the class for any normal classroom subject. How can you use the computer to display time timelines and charts and graphs and even just word processing documents with pictures in them? So I said, I'll take the normal school subjects, the things the kids are learning here at the local public school, and I'll just show them how they can use a computer to make their homework look exceptional to do a little bit better job, to show things, you know, in graphs or use a spreadsheet sometimes. So number one goal was how do you make your homework look good? I taught for 200 hours a year, 200 hours. The kids enjoyed it. We put a lot of fun into the computer, which is easy to do. In order to learn how to use a computer well, you also have to learn how to maintain and keep your own computer running, solve problems, understand what's going on inside, Understanding networks, you know, communication of the world. We had AOL back then. AOL was Macintosh only. You know, my first class, we didn't even have the Internet yet. And it was very important to me to that these young kids could reach out to other people in the world, you know, and communicate that way. And so my class had a lot of different facets. I figured also cameras, photographs. I mean, you can have one homework with a whole bunch of words. You have a bunch of words and then a photograph that just instantly triggers an idea into your mind. 
So digital cameras were a big part of my class from day one. Um, a lot of it was, yeah, like, like the cameras. The first cameras that came out were only for television sets. The board that I had to buy the kids to read in a TV picture cost more than the computer. And then, yeah, but then that also enabled us to move, move ahead and even do videos in my classes from the first class on. And that was always a big part of my class, how to, you know, make your own video. You know, what's commonplace today was a little risque then. And I like to do it when it was risque because then you can never be compared. That's an excellent strategy. <laughs> it's become kind of a cliche among teachers to say that they learn from the kids as well, but I wanted to put the question to you. What did you find you learned from teaching? Maps around and 
always feeling I have a trouble getting the view. I mean, we're getting better at it. Even Google Maps has gotten so much better at, you know, quickly zooming and, you know, scrolling it around. But I used to deal with big, large atlases on paper, and I could very often say, oh, hi, this is the route that I'm going to understand it a lot better than the understanding I get from today's mapping systems on computers and GPS devices. Now, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you one more thing, something that is quite important to you. What is the value of humor and then jokes in the Well, to me, humor is very much the same element as creativity, where you're kind of thinking along a different path, and then a punchline comes and says, oh my gosh, it had a different meaning, like it really had a different meaning that made sense in some way. And that's what creativity is, when you're trying to think of a new idea, a new way to live, or a new way to build a product, or a new product that didn't exist before that gives us an alternative way to watch television or something. You have to think differently and then come out and you have to sit down and start designing something, but in the end it has to converge back on a useful, you know, um, task, things that people want before you're going to be acknowledged as being creative. You have to, you know, have something useful for so many people. You sell a lot of them and you get, then you get noted as being creative. But it's very much like humor. Humor is just thinking a different way, thinking out of the box. You know, if you can make up jokes, that's the element of creativity that I really like. I look at so many comedians that can walk around and make jokes out of their heads so fast, and I think, oh my God, if they were, you know, if they knew technology, they would just come up with, you know, just wild ideas that actually work and are a lot cheaper. Absolutely. And not only that, humor. When you're working very hard in technology and you're working on these projects that just go all night long, and you're just, you can't go home because you're close to the solution. You're close to getting someone, getting something done. You know, we work late, late hours, we engineers, and we have lots of, you know, coats and snacks, and it's not a great lifestyle, but you've got to have something for relief. You know, you've got to have some friends that you can tell a joke to. You've got to be able to go out and laugh at things, have your own little inside jokes and your own special little ways you live, a certain restaurant you all like to go to. Um, it's a very huge part of life for the engineer that works like. Steve Wozniak, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, too. I'm very good being on the show. Ask what's the word. Trying to get a clutch of what I could not get. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B E N A L T H O U S E dot com. For more information and our online show archive, visit Colin Marshall Radio dot com.